today on How They Do It. If you watch my YouTube channel, there's a good chance you've already seen Tom Scott's video. This video has X amount of views. If not, check it out. But basically what he does is run a background job that hits the YouTube API to update the title with the latest view count every few minutes. Then another YouTuber you may have heard of, Mr. Beast, appears to be doing the same thing in his latest video, where the thumbnail updates every few minutes with the amount of money given away. If you're wondering how they do this, you might be a little disappointed when Tom Scott says, I'm not gonna talk about the exact details of my code here. It is not the important part because code is just incredibly dull on camera, but I have to disagree there because in my opinion, the code is the most exciting part. So in today's video, we'll take a deep dive into APIs and I'll show you exactly how these YouTubers are updating their videos automatically in the background. If you're new here, like and subscribe and you can grab the full source code from GitHub. My primary mission today is to teach you everything you need to know about APIs, which is an essential skill for both front-end and back-end developers. Along the way, you'll learn about API authentication and OAuth 2, how to work with Google APIs in Node.js, and how to schedule your code to run in the background with a serverless cloud function. But first, let's answer the question, what is an API? An application programming interface is simply a way for two pieces of software to talk to each other. In this demo, we have our application, which will eventually live on a cloud function. It needs to talk to YouTube to get the view count for a video, and then tell YouTube to update the video with a new title. To facilitate this, YouTube has a standard set of functions where developers can request the data they need. On the web, APIs are accessed over HTTP, or in other words, there's a URL on the internet that connects that server to the rest of the internet. The most popular standard for implementing APIs in today's world is REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer. APIs that implement this standard, like YouTube, are called RESTful APIs. The most important concept to understand is that RESTful APIs are stateless, which means the client and the server don't need to know anything about each other's internal state. Instead, they simply pass messages back and forth. The process starts when the client, your application, makes a request. An HTTP request message has a very specific format. The start line contains the URL of the API you're making a request to. It also contains an HTTP method, or verb, that defines what you're trying to do on the server. A GET request means you're trying to access data but not modify it, whereas a POST request means you're trying to create some new data on the server. The reason this is important is because the API can design endpoints based on a specific entity. We can see that in the YouTube API, where it has different entities for comments, videos, playlists, etc. The cool thing about YouTube is that it has an API explorer, so we can actually look at the the raw HTTP message. For example, to retrieve a list of videos, we point to this video's endpoint as a GET request. Then if we wanted to update that video, we'd point to the same URL, but instead make it a PUT request. So the takeaway here is that the URL defines the resource or entity that lives there, and the verb defines what you want to do to that entity. Now back in the HTTP message, after the start line, we have headers. The headers contain additional metadata about the request, for example, the accept header tells the server which type of content that the client will accept back, which more often than not will be JSON. The headers also handle things like authorization to determine if the user making the request is authorized to do so. Then after the headers, we have the body, which is typically in JSON format, and it contains a payload of data that the server can use to update something or create a new record on the server. Okay, so now that we have our request message, that message gets sent to the server or API. It receives the request and then executes whatever code needs to be done to handle it, like reading or writing to a database, for example. When it's done, it formats an HTTP response message to go back to the client. It also has a very specific format with a start line that contains the status code. There are a bunch of different status codes, and they're used to tell the client what happened to their request. If everything worked, then you should get a 200 status code, which means OK. Codes at the 200 level mean success, codes at the 400 level mean that you did something wrong, and codes at the 500 level mean the server failed for some reason. And then below that, we also have a body, which contains the actual content that the server is sending back down to the client, which is often JSON data or HTML to use in a front-end application. And that's really all there is to it. It's a simple request-response exchange of data between two pieces of software that live on the internet. Now that you know how APIs work, let's build a background job that runs every few minutes to grab the latest view count from YouTube and then update a YouTube video's title. First, we need a piece of software to make API calls from. To handle that, I'll be using a Firebase Cloud function with the Node.js runtime. If you're not a Firebase user already, it's very easy to set up. Install the Firebase command line tools, run Firebase init, and you now have a serverless environment to start writing your code in. Now, YouTube, of course, is a Google product, which means you need to enable the API from the Google Cloud Platform console. Most major APIs out there, Google included, provide software developer kits to work with their APIs. In our Node.js project, we can install the Google APIs package with NPM. What the SDK does is simplify the process of making calls to the API. If you wanted to, you could send raw HTTP requests to Google, and in theory that would work fine, but that would be doing things the hard way. 
When using the SDK, we can import Google into our code, and now we have IntelliSense for not just YouTube, but any Google API. Like if we take a look at Google Drive, for example, you can see it gives us a variety of different endpoints, and then we can simply call a method, and the Google SDK will format the HTTP request for us. So that's awesome, but at this point, we need to schedule a background job to run our code every few minutes. In Cloud Functions, we can do that by first setting up an export with the name of the function, and then we call functions pub sub schedule and pass in a cron schedule as the argument. This translates to run every three minutes, or in Firebase, we have a more readable option of just writing every three minutes. After that, we'll add a callback function that will run every three minutes after we deploy this function to the cloud. Now inside this function, we'll create a variable named YouTube. But in order to use the YouTube API, we need to authenticate. So let's take a second to talk about API authentication. There are two main types of authentication that you should know about right now. API keys and OAuth. When thinking about YouTube, or any API for that matter, there are two main types of resources, those that are public and those that are private. For example, a Git request to a public video is something that anybody can do. But if we wanted to modify that video with a put request, we would need to have the proper authorization to do so, like being the video's owner or being an admin at YouTube. Or as developers, we could get the user's permission using OAuth. So here's what that boils down to. If we only need to read public resources, then we can use our YouTube developer API key. The API key is simply a way for YouTube to identify who is making the request, which is important because it's a free API that has a quota on usage which means that a given API key can only make so many requests per day. In the case of YouTube, they assign points to every request and then cap your daily usage at 10,000 points. Now, because we're updating an actual video, we need to go through OAuth 2 in this case. I'm not going to go through the entire process in this video because it can be somewhat complicated, but if it's something that you're interested in implementing, I have a video for that on Fireship IO. Basically what needs to happen is you need to generate a URL where the user can log into their YouTube or Google account. Then your app will request permission to perform actions on the user's behalf. These permissions are known as scopes. When the user says okay, Google will redirect them back to your site with an authorization code. You then send that code to your server or cloud function and use it to create an access token and refresh token. These values can be saved to a database so you can make API calls for the user in the future. When you're ready to make an API call, you can read the tokens from your database and create this OAuth2 client object, and then you use it as the auth argument. Now that we're authenticated, we can make an HTTP request to the API using the Google API's SDK. We call YouTube videos list with the video ID, and then we specify the data that we want back. In our case, we want the statistics, which will include the view count, and also the snippet, which contains the raw data about the video, like the description, title, and so on. The API responds back with JSON, which is automatically converted into a JavaScript object for us, and the actual data about this video is the first element in the items array. From there, we'll grab the view count, then interpolate it into a string to format the new title. And now we're ready to update our video. We'll call YouTube videos update, and then we'll define a request body. Remember, the body is the data that the API will use to make the update. We'll assign it the new title, and then it also requires a category ID, which we can keep from the original snippet. And that's all there is to it. Now we just need to deploy our code to get it running in production. Open up the command line and run Firebase Deploy. This will deploy your code as a serverless function in the cloud. You'll see your function in the Firebase console. If your function doesn't seem to be working, you can check out the logs for errors. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe. And if you want access to more advanced content, consider becoming a pro member at Fireship.io. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.